Hey everyone, welcome back to Wicked Deeds. We're your hosts, I'm Brittany. And I'm John. And today we're going to be discussing the case of a young woman that had a fierce passion for horseback riding, who, after entering an acquaintance's vehicle one night, was never seen or heard from again. The circumstances surrounding her case became more and more bizarre as the years went on and more information became available to the public. With that new information, authorities have finally named one person in particular they're interested in speaking with, who may be able to answer some very important questions. Today's case is about the disappearance of Jan Cotta. Jan Andre Cotta was born on March 26, 1954, and was one of eight children. There were a total of three girls and five boys in the Cotta family. Jan was the oldest, and then I can't quite tell the exact order of siblings below her, outside of a sister Robin, who was a year younger than her, and her brother Brian, who was two years younger. The other siblings were Douglas, Jay, Christopher, Kevin, and Tracy. Jan had previously lived with her parents and seven siblings in a town known as Spring Lake Heights, New Jersey, before the Cotta family moved to Wall Township, New Jersey, at a home located at 19 Ridgewood Road. Spring Lake Heights was only about three miles from Wall, which amounted to about a 10-minute drive, so it didn't seem like too much of a big change with this move. It's reported that the Cotta family's new home on Ridgewood Road was actually a horse farm, and they housed up to 15 horses on their property. As you can imagine, there were likely lots of chores to be done, but also lots of hands to help with having eight children. It seems as though each family member did their part around the farm, and the Cotta kids had a pretty good childhood and upbringing. It's unclear exactly when they moved to this home on Ridgewood Road in Wall, New Jersey, but I believe it was in the late 60s, early 70s, because a little while after Jan and her family had moved, she'd gotten involved with a 4-H club in the area called the Jumping Brook Riders 4-H Club. Now, as someone who never knew what a 4-H club was prior to doing my research for this episode, I found it to be a little difficult to define because it can kind of cover a plethora of subject areas. But the original 4-H seems to be based on four pillars, which are said to be head, heart, hands, and health. Basically, though, this group she joined was something of a passion for her. If you couldn't guess based on the name, the Jumping Brook Riders 4-H Club was essentially a horse club, and Jan was right at home with this crew because obviously we know she had a ton of horses at home and she lived on a horse farm, but she adored horses and had a serious talent with them as well. A detective with the Wall PD, Joseph Wilbert, even stated, quote, Jan lived for horses. That was the love of her life, end quote. So within this 4-H club, Jan went on to participate in competitions and also showed her horses. It's been said that she didn't only compete, though. She enjoyed riding just to ride without any competition aspect to it. Also, according to the Coast Star, Jan's sister Robin, quote, described her as a typical sister who had a special affinity for horses. She said her sister spoke her mind on occasion, but she had a real heart for animals, end quote. Kind of like us. Yeah, absolutely. Not so good with people. Animals, much better. Those are our people. (laughs) (laughs) Now, I had mentioned before that Jan was actually very talented in this hobby of hers. And I say that because when I first started researching this case, before I really even knew any basic information about Jan, I had searched just for her name on newspapers.com. And I'd seen a lot of articles from the early 70s, prior to 73 when she disappeared, with her name listed. And at first, I didn't realize that this was actually the same person. But I went back once I discovered her love for horses and competition and realized that all of these previous articles that came up were actually about Jan and these shows that she participated in with her horses. Her sister told the Coast Star, quote, When Jan started getting ready for her show, she was a perfectionist when it came time to ready the horse for the shows, end quote. So clearly, she cared a lot about this and spent a lot of time in this world. So I wanted to actually give you a brief rundown of some of her accomplishments in the years before she went missing. 
So between October of 1969 and April of 1970, Jan had competed in at least three events and won first place in one of them and second in the other two. By 1971, she'd been appointed the vice president of the Jumping Brook Riders 4-H Club and also received a scholarship to attend the English Equitation Clinic. Then, from April of 1972 through December of 1972, she competed several more times, with her winning three of the events and being named reserve champion in one other. And at some point during this time as well, she'd gone to the Princeton Riding Academy and also began giving horseback riding lessons at her family's farm. Also, I found this statement about Jan in the Messenger Press, and I think this shows her work ethic. Quote, Jan Cotta of Allenwood, who rode the grand champion English horse Sunday, is not content to let her riding ability reach a status quo. She will be attending the Morvan Park Equestrian Institution in Leesburg, Virginia, either in June or September, end quote. And then the last article I found about Jan and her competitions with the 4-H Club was in also the Messenger Press, and this article was published on March 1st, 1973, which was just under four months before she would go missing. There's a photo of her on horseback with a passage underneath that states, quote, Jan Cotta, who plans to go to England this fall for one year to study equitation, is shown a broad tap dancer after winning the open horsemanship, end quote. Okay, so as we continue on and begin discussing the timeline of events of this case, I wanted to bring something up that I feel has been a pretty common occurrence over the past couple cases I've researched and covered. Yet again, there is practically nothing reported on in the early days of this investigation, which feels very reminiscent of Mitchell and Bonnie's case over the past two weeks, not only because there wasn't much reported on, but also because of the fact that Jan seemed to be classified as a runaway, from what I can tell from the very beginning. But I also don't think this was as negligible of a job on the police's part as Mitchell and Bonnie's case was. But I'll give you a brief rundown of what took place and when Jan was last seen prior to moving into what's reported in later years on this case. So on Tuesday, June 26th, 1973, between 11.30 p.m. and midnight, 19-year-old Jan Cotta was seen by her brother Brian and one of his friends in what's been described as a barn tack house on their property. Now, I was not exactly sure what a barn tack house or a barn tack room was, so I did a quick Google search, and according to dcbuilding.com, quote, tack rooms are a barn's mission control, the place where equestrian gear is organized and stored. Tack is a term that describes accessories for all things horse. Saddles, bridles, bits, wraps, blankets, these are all considered tack, end quote. Also, according to a more recent article on this case with the Coast Star, the barn tack room, or barn tack house, whatever you want to call it, was located at the back of the Cotta's property. It was not up near the road from what I can tell. And before we keep going, I did just want to mention that I have tried my damnedest to find where this property was located back in 73, and I cannot for the life of me figure it out. So, John, I sent you some aerial views of Ridgewood Road in New Jersey as of today, and I just want you to open up and take a look at it so we can discuss. Okay. So the first one is going to show you one half of Ridgewood Road, and then the second one will show you the other half of Ridgewood Road. Basically, a highway kind of cuts it in half. You're talking about 34 cutting it in half? Yes. Okay. So it's on like either side of the highway. Basically, it just like breaks it into Mm -hmm. two separate sides. Yep. So looking at this, It seems as though there's a lot of infrastructure there now, and I'm pretty certain it wasn't built up like this back in the day, especially considering the fact that it was said that Jan's family's home was a horse farm. So it would have had to have been a relatively large parcel of land, probably at least a couple acres, you're thinking, right? Yeah, I would assume so. Like what stands out to me is the area north of Ridgewood Road Mm -hmm. near Sunnyside Manor. That looks like a big open parcel of land there, even still today. Yes, I agree, but there's also no houses near there. And they obviously had this house on the property, and they had this barn on the property, and if she's giving riding lessons, if they have 15 horses, you're thinking they have pastures, they probably have a lot of space, right? Right, but if it's not there anymore, Mm -hmm. then the property was sold to somebody, and they could have leveled the house, and they could have built whatever. This is very true. So without like uh, a general idea of... Was it on the northern part of Ridgewood Road or was it on the southern part or whatever? 
it's really open to interpretation. It could have been where their house could have been where Sunnyside Manor is now. Mm -hmm. They leveled the house, they built the manor, and then they just own the rest of the property. I mean, that's definitely true, but there's more to it than that. Like as I was kind of digging and trying to figure everything out about where it could have been, because you know me, Mm -hmm. I like to find out where people lived. You like properties. (laughs) I do. Yeah. So the thing that's frustrating about this is that the numbers on the houses on Ridgewood Road or really even the businesses, it doesn't matter what it is, the numbers are totally different. Number 19 isn't even a thing because the numbers start in the two and three thousands. So you're looking at like 3245, 3246, like those are the numbers you're seeing on the road. 19 is clearly very different. So then it got me thinking because, again, we all know my affinity for houses and properties and all that. If it was possible that those properties could have been renumbered. And I discovered that that's actually a thing. It's not super common, but it has happened before, as has street renaming. So I'm wondering if one of two things happened here. It could be that Ridgewood Road is not where this Ridgewood Road is. And maybe it was a different one and they changed names, which I don't Mm -hmm. think is that likely. Or what I believe to be more likely is that the houses were renumbered and... There was obviously more built up over time. And either, like you said, the property was demolished. It was bought out by somebody. And then, you know, they put something different there. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it is a house that's here now, but they removed the farm portion, renumbered the houses. We don't know exactly which one it is. And then multiple other houses were built around it. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, I totally get what you're saying. I think either way is plausible. Okay. However, I did find online through a search database that Jan's mother, Dorothy, had owned 3246 Ridgewood Road at one point, but it's on the very like suburban side of this street. So I don't know if she moved or like I said before, like they could have subdivided, whatever. But I'm just annoyed at the end of the day that I can't like figure out which house was theirs so I can... I don't know. You just want to know. Like I want to dig into this more. I want to look at the mortgage records. I want to see like when they bought it. I want to see like... Did they pay their taxes? You know, like all these different things that I feel like could go into the background in this case to find like where she lived. And so, yeah, you're right. I just want to find it. Like, I just want to know. Yeah. And I can't figure it out. I think it's something that you can usually find pretty easily. Yeah. And the fact that you can't in this case, it's kind of getting to you. But what investigative information would you gather from knowing where the house was? Well, I'd like to know like who her neighbors were. Could somebody else have seen her? I mean, honestly, who lived around the area? And like, I was even so crazy with this that I was looking at like vintage aerial maps <laughs> of Wall Township, New Jersey from yep. the 70s. But like, none of them are labeled. It's literally just an overhead view of random neighborhoods and stuff in yeah. New Jersey. So it's like, you can't even pinpoint it based on that. But I just think knowing like who her neighbors were, who could have been around, did authorities talk to them? Do you know if 34 has always been there? Since when she went missing? 3246? No. Highway 34. Oh, I think so. I'm not positive, though. If there's anyone from the area that knew, I would like to... If you're looking at these vintage maps and Mm -hmm. it's an overhead, yeah, can you see 34 on there and then, you know, overlay the map onto another one? I mean, that could probably be possible, but it's also hard to, like, zoom in and again, like... And you don't know where... where, If it's unmarked, you don't know where her house was. And I also don't know, like... The highways aren't marked either. It's literally just like a bird's eye view of an area. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was the 70s. You know what I mean? It's not like it is today where you have things like Google Maps and you could say, oh, great, that's Ridgewood Road. That's Highway 34 or whatever. But okay, after that brief property ownership sidebar, let's get back to what took place on the night of June 26, 1973, the night Jan Cotta disappeared. So after Brian and his friend saw Jan around the barn tack room, a car was also seen pulling up the driveway on the Cotta's farm and was driving toward the back of the property, I believe in the direction of the barn where Jan was last seen. It has been mentioned that the car did belong to someone who knew Jan, and I believe that she obviously knew them too, but the interesting thing is that the term acquaintance has been used to describe this person, not friend. I wonder if it's somebody that she may have met at one of these horse shows that she went to i feel like that's a common thing with this case is that a lot of people think that like whoever her friends were like a lot of them were probably within that community and i mean for all we know it totally could have been someone in that community that you know came to the house that night yeah and if she's always doing well at these shows Mm. she's going to garner attention from people that are in that community 
maybe unwanted attention from other people because she's always in the news. Mm, that's true. Yeah, she was in the paper like a lot. So she's well known in that community at least. Mm-hmm. And then also maybe people that just saw her in the newspaper. Yes. But it's also stated that Jan's sister, Robin, is who specifically saw the car pull into the property, but she never saw it leave. And I will say, no, the car has never been described, so I don't know what it looked like. But then I think someone else at home, probably one of her other siblings or maybe one of her parents, heard this car leave the property. But it doesn't seem as though anyone saw anything else or really heard anything else after that. And as I mentioned, Robin was the one who saw the car coming onto the property. I'm not sure if any of the other siblings or parents did, but I know for sure she was reported to have seen it. But she never saw it leaving because she obviously didn't think anything about it seemed suspicious. So I doubt she was like peering out the window waiting to see what happened between Jan and the driver of the vehicle. But after this sighting of Jan on the 26th and the sighting of the car coming onto the property, that is the last time anyone would see Jan Kata, as she never returned home, assuming she potentially left with this individual driving the car. Now, the following day, Wednesday, June 27th, Jan's mother, Dorothy, reported her daughter missing. It's mentioned that an investigation or a file for Jan's case was opened, but like I said earlier on, from what I can tell, not too, too much was done at first because it seems as though she was considered a runaway. And there's actually a lot more that goes into this that's uncovered later, so just keep that in mind as we keep going. At this point, though, I do want to give a brief description of what Jan looked like, what she was last seen wearing, and some important identifying features about her as well. When Jan was last seen in late June of 1973, she was described as 5 feet 4 inches tall, anywhere from 118 to 125 pounds. This kind of changes over time, but that's the range I've seen. And she had long-ish light brown hair and blue eyes, as well as a mole near the left side of her mouth. She was last seen wearing a white shirt with some sort of blue design on it, blue landlubber's jeans, and brown loafers. Have you ever seen landlubber's jeans? No. This very much so reminded me of Kristen's round table at True Crime Podcast Festival when she was pulling up those old ads for the stuff that um, Reeves Johnson might have bought. Oh, yeah, yeah. And this is like very much so what these reminded me of. So those first two photos are said to just be like vintage ones that like someone's posing in today. But the the third and fourth one that I sent you, like, aren't those ads just so 70s, like 60s and 70s? They're very Austin Powers, James Bond girl. Yeah. Like 70s disco-ish jeans. It doesn't say anywhere that the jeans she was last seen wearing were like flared jeans. But I mean, it was the early 70s. That's what I could imagine. So... I just figured I would like put up a picture of these just in case like nobody knows what these types of jeans looked like because I had mm-hmm. no idea. So like if someone said that to me, I'd be like, what does that even mean? Like well, I mean, what kind we of have, jeans were those? Like you have that current picture mm-hmm. with somebody wearing the vintage jeans. Yep. And then you have all these other ones that are also flared, it looks like. Yeah, it seems it like, like that's the style. style jean. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so she was also said to be carrying a round tweed purse as well as wearing a quote plain gold ring with the initials J-A-C and a gold ring with a blue topaz birthstone and two diamonds, end quote. Jan also had some medical conditions, which included a crippled or potentially even clubbed left foot. She'd at some point in the past fractured her left wrist. She sometimes got a lazy right eye when she was cold or tired. She suffered from asthma as well as possibly even epilepsy. Are these all things that she sustained from riding horses? That I am not sure. I would have to think maybe the fractured left wrist. I don't know about her foot. That could have been something that maybe she was born with. I'm not exactly sure like how these conditions developed over time. But like on the Doe Network and NamUs and all these other sites, there's like so much listed about her, her medical conditions, all these things that she suffered from in regards to her health. So she was clearly dealing with a lot with that so it's just surprising to hear that she had all these ailments Mm. and she was still doing so well in like a physical sport yeah definitely but to have a clubbed foot yeah be able to ride a horse i don't really know i mean i guess maybe once your foot is in a boot it doesn't affect it the same way when i think of a clubbed foot it means like isn't it like you you drag like you can't really use it it's like you drag it almost i don't think so i think it's more so in like the way it was formed But I also don't know, like, maybe she got stepped on or something and, like, 
so I saw it listed both ways that it could have been clubbed or it could have been crippled. Oh, okay. And of course, like you have to think back to the 70s and how mm -hmm. they would describe someone as crippled. So it's like, did her foot get crushed by a horse or like something like that? And it was just not the same again. Mm -hmm. Or I'm not exactly sure like what the context there is and what that means. But yep. it was also reported that Jan hadn't had any dental work done whatsoever. And her teeth were described as being in, quote, poor condition. It's also mentioned that she might even potentially go by an alias of Jane Andrea Cotta, which really isn't that big of a variation of her real name. So I'm not exactly sure what this means or why it's considered an alias, but that's how it's been described pretty much everywhere this case has been discussed. Her name has been described that way? Yeah, so it's Jan Andre Cotta. And then it says that she could potentially go by an alias of Jane Andrea Cotta which is literally one additional letter on the end of her first name and her middle name. And that's it. Yeah. So it's like, did someone just screw up her name or <laughs> right. like, I don't know. And I, mean, I just she's think got that's plenty so strange. Of family members to ask, did she ever go by this name? Yeah, I don't know. So I'm wondering if they were asked in the future, because obviously we know nothing was really done in the beginning like I know they said they they looked into things but it just seems like it was kind of pushed to the wayside because it was like oh she just ran away mm -hmm. which is just very common I feel like we hear about that a lot especially considering the fact that she's an adult well I feel like we haven't really got to the point where police say that she's a runaway I know that her mom no one says her. it because there's nothing talked about well I know her mom reported her missing the next day mm -hmm. but then what happened from there that's an excellent question, but we're about to get into it a little bit. But lastly, there's one very important thing I need to tell you, and it's probably one of the most identifying things about Jan, at least right when she went missing. And it's that she was anywhere from five to seven months pregnant. Interesting. It's a real curveball. I think so. You haven't mentioned a boyfriend or a significant other or anything at this point? No, I have not, because I don't actually know if she had one, and... Before you ask your next question, no, I don't know who the baby's father is or was. Interesting. Now, I know that's a lot of information that I just threw at you, but I do think all of it is important. And I think it could help jog someone's memory if they remember seeing a woman that may have fit some of these descriptors back in 73 or maybe even later, especially the pregnancy. Right. I mean, if you have, let's say, on the long term of the scale, mm -hmm. you have a seven month pregnant 19 year old girl who may have something pretty easily distinguishable with a lazy eye and a clubbed foot. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you had a lineup of 10 people and only one person fit that bill, I think it would be pretty easy to stand out there. Yeah, definitely. So it's just one of those things where it's important to think back and say, if anybody saw her or something like that, those are very identifying features to say, like, I remember this girl because of this, this, and this. Right. But back to the investigation, or I guess lack thereof, because I really... Don't know if there was anything going on within the PD, but if there was, the public was not made aware of it, honestly made aware of any of it in the beginning. Just had a question thinking about her family and the farm and everything. Sure. Do you know like what the status of the farm was back then? Was it like a hustle and bustle place where a lot of people went to to ride horses and to take lessons and stuff like that? Or were they like a failing family business that's just, you know, hanging on? making ends meet type thing because they got eight kids, mm -hmm. all these animals to take care of. Do you have any idea of what home life? I know you said it was like a normal upbringing, mm -hmm. but so with it's, the business? So first of all, I don't know. I'm not sure exactly if it was a business, if it was more of a hobby thing. Like, I mean, I would assume it would be a business. Like you would want to make money from that. I had seen that her mom had like a regular day job back in the day, but I'm not sure if like, the dad focused on the farm or anything like that. But one thing I wanted to mention that I did see a lot on forums was in regards to like the family's money in general. Obviously, eight kids is a lot of kids. And to take care of 15 horses, I mean, I'm sure that's expensive too. And then a lot of people mentioned the fact that Jan didn't have any dental work done. Right. Was that because they did not have money? Well, I was wondering or, if Jan has these ailments and she doesn't have any dental work done. And she has all these siblings. Do they have any ailments that are like because their family didn't have the best funds available to be able to ha send their kids to the doctors and stuff like that mm -hmm. for like preventative care and shit. And then that also leads to the fact of down the line, mm -hmm. if they weren't well off 
in their business venture yep. with the farm, could that have dragged it down over time? Obviously, they have this tragedy where their daughter disappears. Mm -hmm. They're already maybe just scrounging things together. Mm -hmm. Then they lose the property. They sell the property. Maybe it hadn't been maintained that well. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So it just got leveled. And maybe mm -hmm. that's why it's so much harder to really narrow down where it was. Mm, that's now, a good point. Yeah. Because the state of it back then may not have been you know, outstanding. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. I'm not sure. I wish I knew more. If I had to guess, I would think they were probably middle class. I don't think it was like they were super wealthy or anything like that. But mm -hmm. you also have to think if she's competing in all of these shows and she's a part of this group and all of that, that probably costs money. You think about it now with kids today doing sports and stuff like that. It's expensive. So, yeah, I would think that they had to be middle class or lower middle class. Yeah. Because if you have this daughter that's entering all these competitions and she's doing so well, you have this farm with, you know, over a dozen horses. Mm hmm. If you're like a pillar of that community, like mm -hmm. the horse community, you would probably have some influence. And when your daughter mm -hmm. goes missing, people are going to care and people are going to and there's going to mm. be an investigation. I see what you're saying. Yep. So just to try and build a profile of the family mm -hmm. and how things were, you'd assume that they're not well off mm -hmm. and they weren't very influential, which is probably why nobody looked into this. Do you Early also on. think that it could have something to do with the tabooness of being pregnant out of wedlock back in the 70s? I don't know. Do you? I don't know what it was like back then. <laughs> I know it's different today, but I even think like back in the late 90s, early 2000s, like watching those Lifetime movies of like girls who would get pregnant in high school and they were so ostracized. And like if you're thinking about that and how that was maybe even in the 90s, what was it like back in the 70s, especially considering this community? I mean... Mm. Maybe they were particularly religious. I'm not sure if that's even accurate, but what if they were? What if that was something that was totally frowned upon? And, you know, maybe the police just deemed it like this as well because it's like, oh, she's a pregnant 19-year-old who's not in think, a relationship. I don't think police would be swayed one way or the other to look into this you would based hope. on her pregnancy. No, I don't believe so. Maybe, like, community-wise, like, if you think of, I don't know, insert any random drama of the time where, you know, you have this girl that gets pregnant from maybe a chance encounter mm -hmm. and, you know, all these other moms in the community are talking shit type thing. Yeah. I could see that happening, but I don't see a police department being like, oh, she was pregnant out of wedlock. She's a slut. We're not going to look into it. Yeah, you know, I see what like, you're saying there. But there are also other things that go into it as well. And then, you know... The more we keep going, I think maybe you'll start to understand that a little bit more. So maybe my question is a little premature in All regards right. to the pregnancy. Well, we'll revisit it and then and I'll let you know if I change my mind. OK. OK, so back in the beginning, when Jan first went missing, I was looking on newspapers.com and I was trying to find as much as I could from the early days. And I was only able to find four articles from the first year or so after Jan went missing all of which are very, very brief overviews, if that, of her disappearance. Which seems strange because from what it sounded like, mm -hmm. there were probably more articles about her in the newspaper prior to her disappearance than after. That is exactly right. So the first article I found was from late July, just under a month after Jan had gone missing which was pretty much just like a miniature missing persons flyer. It had her picture, the fact that she was missing, and a number to call. The same thing is reported about a week later, this time with a plea from her parents that stated, quote, Jan, please let your daddy and mother know if you're well and alive, end quote. Did they ever come forward, her parents, that is, to say, you know, things weren't great at home, maybe because she did get pregnant and there was extra pressure and she's also the oldest. She's an adult now. They have seven other kids to worry about. Mm -hmm. Did she like seem ostracized kind of from her family after something like that happened? Nope. It did not seem that way at all. Her parents, unfortunately, I cannot find for the life of me anything about her father. Can't even find his name. Her mother passed away in 2005, and that was around the time where things seemed to like heat up a little bit more in this case. But nothing before that was said by her saying she may have left with this person. That I could find? Absolutely not. Okay. There was one article in particular, though, that came out about a month after this one that was 
put out in the end of July, so this was now late August, and it stood out to me. It's in an Asbury Park Press article that actually isn't even really dedicated to Jan's case specifically, but it's about runaways in general. What's stated under Jan's picture that's to the right of this article is what intrigued me for a couple reasons. But before I explain why it intrigued me, I want to read to you what it says. It states, quote, The distraught father of another 15-year-old girl who had run away three times and is believed to have left two weeks ago with a 22-year-old man says every agency has failed him, end quote. So I have some thoughts on this, and I think you do too, John, with your furrowed brow over there. First and foremost, Jan was not 15. She was 19. Jen wasn't 15, she was 19. Mm -hmm. And she also has only disappeared once. Not three times with random men, probably. So I don't know if this was a screw-up, like the whole age thing to start with, because the photo to the left of Jan's is of a 15-year-old girl who went missing. So maybe they were just like, oh, another 15-year-old girl? Like, it's her picture, it's her name there, so I think they must have known that it was Jan. So how did they screw up her age? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Then the other thing about this is that the article came out at the end of August, two months after Jan was last seen. Yet this snippet says she was last seen two weeks prior to this article's release. So is that another mistake? It seems that way. And third, if we can even believe what this article was saying due to two previous mistakes and literally the one sentence comment under the photo, the fact that she'd run away multiple times before, I mean... Could that be complete and total BS or could that be one of the reasons why police are classifying her as a runaway? I don't know if this article is being written and referencing some other 15 year old girl that ran away. It was actually referencing four people that had run away. So I was going to say if runaways were a common thing in this area Mm -hmm. of girls of a age bracket similar to Jan's, maybe they've just gotten so used to girls in that age running away. That they were like, eh, another runaway. Yeah, and that's the thing that's interesting. So I'm also kind of inferring that she was technically actually classified as a runaway because there were two articles. So I said I had found four. So there were those couple ones that were just like missing persons flyers. And then there were these two other articles that featured Jan. She was mentioned in them, but they were dedicated to runaways and why kids of that age ran away with the reasoning behind their decision to run away was but like in one of these articles three of the four that were discussed had come back and jan was the only one that hadn't including this one from the article you were just talking about yeah so it's like did she have any connection to these other kids it didn't seem that way no i think it was just like kids in that area that had run away were they kids that had any involvement in horse riding and horse showing i don't think so i don't think any of them were like related in any way i think it was just these were people who ran away in the area but it's like Police never came out and said, we classified her as a runaway. It's like what I'm inferring based on the fact that there was literally nothing. No one talked about it. Right. There was no article with a headline saying, 19-year-old girl goes missing, family pleads for assistance in helping to find her. Yeah, there's nothing like that. So it's like, you have to kind of assume. I think that if you know of multiple people Mm -hmm. being reported on in articles as runaways, maybe it was an epidemic in that area. Mm, And she ended up just getting lumped into it Mm -hmm. just because there were so many others. And it happened around the same time and it was just like an unfortunate coincidence and she gets brought into this. Right. And if it's all these kids in the area that are running away Mm -hmm. and this is potentially maybe a small area covered by a small police department Mm -hmm. and it's the same couple cops always going to these calls. Yeah. They're probably a little jaded when it comes to trying to find these kids. You said that you had multiple that run away and come back. Mm -hmm. It's like you start to get in that mindset of, oh, this is a pattern that I've seen with all these other kids. This is probably going to fall in line with that same pattern Mm -hmm. and maybe didn't necessarily do their due diligence on it. And unfortunately, it was not the same. Yeah. And something else that I wanted to mention to you, too, and it's also kind of why I asked you that question about the pregnancy and, you know, being pregnant out of wedlock and like that whole thing. And it's because none of these articles all of these ones that were reported early on, not one single one described Jan as being pregnant. It only explained like, oh, she's five foot four, this many pounds and call this number in case you see her. Mm. Like, wouldn't you think that it would be an indicator to say, hey, this girl has a big pregnant belly. You should watch out for her. Yeah. And a lot of times like totally unrelated, but kind of related Mm -hmm. when you have sex workers that go missing or that may be murdered or disappear. Yeah. A lot of times 
they leave that out of the articles and the press releases because they don't want to stigmatize the victim. Yeah. So maybe they did that in this respect as well Mm -hmm. because of society's feelings. On that, yeah. On that at the time, maybe. And then now you have me, now that we've revisited this question. (laughs) We'll revisit it more later too. (laughs) I'm thinking, you know, if I was the cop that went there Mm -hmm. all these times and all these girls were running away with random men and then coming back after they get their kicks in or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, I now have this 19-year-old girl that's seven months pregnant, potentially no boyfriend to speak of that we know of, and she disappeared too. I could see myself being jaded in that respect and saying, you know, maybe another runaway. Yeah, and that's like a hard determination to come to, I feel like, at least like for me, but I can understand where that mindset might come from because it's, it's hard to say that in 2022 to say, we have all these resources at our fingertips. We have surveillance cameras. We have phones. We have all this stuff. 1973 was literally half a century ago. Mm-hmm. Like that is a long, long time when you think about it. Yeah. And life was very, very different. And so you have to like kind of take yourself and put your brain in the brain of like one of those cops and say, for you to just say right now in 2022 that you can see yourself thinking that way, I'm sure people would be like, what's wrong with you? You're crazy. Like, why would you ever think like that? It's not like that. It's It's, going back to that mindset. In a sense, it's also the same today because I'm looking at it through like the police officer's eyes where, Mm -hmm. you know, he has all these other girls running away and then coming back and then running away again and then coming back and running away again. Yeah, not all of them were girls either. There were also boys that had run away too. Sure, so... You have all types of people running away, coming back, and then a continuous, you know, yeah, it's like cycle. a revolving door where they're just, they're, re- they're leaving and then they're coming back and it just keeps happening over and over again. Yeah. If you look at it from a, your day-to-day perspective or from, you know, any perspective where the same thing happens to you all the time, mm-hmm. you get jaded about it. Is it hard to look past that if maybe you don't have people pushing or maybe there are other clues that are indicating That a runaway is the main thing here. Think of it this way. So in a more, not serious way, but like, uh, think of like probably a city cop, right? Mm -hmm. You have gang shootings all the time. When you've dealt with, you know, 10 gang shootings Mm -hmm. over the past couple weeks and another shooting happens in that same area again, Mm -hmm. what are you thinking? Fucking A, another gang shooting going Mm -hmm. on. It's like that thing where you get, you get almost numb to it and- it's easy to get lost in not have like the sincerity going forward yeah. that you would provide to the 15th instance of the same type of case that you would to, you know, the first that you deal with. Yeah, I totally get that. Now, after this, literally nothing, not one freaking thing is reported in Jan's case for 24 years. What about like with her parents and all her siblings? Nothing. Not a peep. It is truly mind-boggling to me, or shall I say, beyond beyond belief to me, <laughs> that there are cases that are so heavily publicized that have hundreds upon hundreds of articles written about them. And then there are cases like this one, and sadly so many more, that get zero attention. It's beyond unfair, and honestly, I don't think I'll ever understand it. Yeah, to think that it goes on for 24 years without anything additional mm-hmm. reported on, and... You had her parents coming out saying, you know, with like a plea to the public and to their daughter, Mm -hmm. you know, please come forward for that to just like stop Mm -hmm. or not be reported on Mm -hmm. and then go on for so long. Mm -hmm. I feel like before I started researching these cases and learning more about like the behind the scenes of true crime rather than being like the type of person that just consumed content, I didn't really understand like the power of the media and like the power that a family can come forward to the media with to be like, Hey, I have this case. I, this is my daughter, my sister, my whoever, and push the media to put something out. I feel like some people probably just didn't even know that. Mm -hmm. Like I can just see these poor people, these poor parents, these siblings, like not knowing for so long that they could reach out to reporters, that they could do these things. They probably believed that the police were the ones that needed to do this to get, this information out there and it's like sometimes we've talked about it before like oh where's the family why aren't they saying anything or whatever it is maybe they just didn't know yeah and i think too like even if they did know Mm -hmm. and they approached the media hello the media (laughs) 
<laughs> Another Bob's Burgers <laughs> reference. It's one of those things that where they could have shown them to the side too because maybe mm-hmm. they saw the police report and maybe the police report did say that, you know, she was a runaway and they had no leads to work. Mm-hmm. Why are they going to put that on the news when that's not necessarily something that's going to get viewership? Yeah, and, and that's the thing that sucks about it. Well, the media sucks in general. I fucking hate the media. It's all agenda-based. If you have influence and you can get in with them, mm-hmm. you know, like I was saying with when I was trying to create like a general profile for the family, mm. if they were a wealthy family with a lot of influence in the horse community mm-hmm. and they had this big, powerful enterprise yeah. at the farm, I guarantee that there would have been more media coverage. The police would have been looking everywhere for this girl mm-hmm. and there probably would have been a community effort mm-hmm. out searching for her. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, thankfully, 24 years later, things start to change. So by 1997, two private investigators became involved in Jan's case after the family had reached out to them to try and get them involved to hopefully reinvestigate the case because it doesn't seem like much had been uncovered, at least that we know of by this time. Like we were just talking about with the media, you'd think that if Jan was found or if there was this huge lead or something like that, it probably would have made the news. At least I hope it would have. Yeah, you would hope so. As far as the private investigators go, do you know who reached out to them like who from the family yes specifically it was brian so the The third oldest second oldest second oldest no third nope you're right i'm wrong okay (laughs) say third oldest first oldest son first oldest son yes so he and his wife specifically had pushed to restart the investigation into jan's disappearance so it was reported in october of 1997 that these PIs were now involved, but they had actually started looking into the case about a year prior, so October of 1996. I would assume that Jan's family was probably shopping around for people to take this case on, at least sporadically throughout the 24 years that led up to the time Mm. where these guys finally took the case on. Yeah, definitely. But you're also thinking 24 years, and you initially thought that she was a runaway. Yes, she's an adult. She can make that decision if she wants to. She doesn't have to come back. But you would think after 24 years... That she wouldn't have tried to get in touch with her family in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. I think it's iffy. I think out of every case, out of like the 50 some odd cases that I've researched so far for this podcast, the only one that I've been somewhat convinced that might have run away was Vicki Lee Lamberton. (laughs) Yeah. It takes a lot to convince me that somebody would just up and leave their life. Yeah, absolutely. The only thing that I can think of as far as like a runaway, at least at this point, is like once she became pregnant Mm -hmm. or... Now that you got these other seven siblings, was she like, not the black sheep of the family, but I don't know. It didn't seem that way, though. It really didn't. I know that you already said that it didn't seem that way, but I'm wondering if, you know. Maybe she felt that way. Maybe she felt that way. That's possible. I mean, that's valid. Or maybe this person, this acquaintance Mm -hmm. was a man, the one that was seen driving onto the property. Yeah. Was a man and it was the baby's father. And he was like, hey, let's go. Maybe. We're going to leave. That's possible. But But it just doesn't seem likely. So there's a lot more. All right, let's go. I'm going to give you a lot of it now. So not only were the PIs working on Jan's case, but along with this one, they were actually investigating another missing woman. And her name was Carolyn Jean Decker, which I shit you not, a quick Google search on her gives you nothing. Oh, great. Literally nothing. So that was just really frustrating to be like, great, another case where there's no information on them. Deemed a runaway. That's it. From the same area? Yes. And... Thankfully, you see these PIs. Now they're jumping in on cases that are clearly neglected. So that gave me my, you know, hope in humanity a little bit. Like it gave it back a little. But the two PIs involved were Edward O'Neill, who at the time was 84 years old. And then Glenn Patrick Kenny. 84 years old. Mm -hmm. I think of my Pepe. Yes. Could you imagine him investigate? He would. He probably would. (laughs) He definitely would. If it had anything to do with trucks, he would. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's a man that's seen a lot of stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, O'Neill had been in the private investigation field for 25 years, and oddly enough, he'd actually started in the field back in 1973, the same year Jan went missing, and he opened his business, Confidential Research Investigators, that same year. So, 25 years ago? Essentially, yeah, about that. Okay. So, he would have been 60. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm going to guess that he did, like... 35 years in law enforcement, and then started a private investigation firm. There was more information on him, and I don't have it readily available. Do you want me to look it up? (laughs) No, I bet. That's what I'm guessing. I'm thinking this is a guy that's like a lifelong law enforcement personnel, 
So it says in this Asbury Park Press article, quote, he entered the field after retiring from AT&T in 1973, end quote. What? Right. AT&T. Yeah. I, I was like, I definitely was... didn't think that he was in law enforcement. And I guess he had also, he hired that Glenn Kenny guy, the other private investigator. So I think they worked together and then... Maybe Glenn Kenny was law enforcement or military. Maybe, yeah. It says... You have to have some type of background to get people to hire you. Yeah, it says he was a Red Bank private investigator. So okay. maybe he was like already and then like moved over mm-hmm. to O'Neill's business. Yeah. But the thing about this now at this point in time is that O'Neill was retired. I mean, obviously he's 84. Right. But he seemed to come out of retirement at least or at least take a break from retirement to work on these cases. I wonder if he was from the area at the time of her disappearance. I'm not sure. I mean, obviously she wouldn't have been in his like group. He was right. in his 60s, you know. But there had to be something that connected him to this case to come out of retirement. Well, so he wasn't the one that was initially reached out to. Glenn Kenny was. Oh, okay. And then Glenn reached back out to Ed and was like, hey, I need your help. Probably because he realized like, or he knew from working with him for so many years, how talented Mm -hmm. and very dedicated to his work Ed O'Neill was. I bet his wife was pissed. Oh my God, yeah, exactly. probably like, are You're you kidding me? years old, you ain't going to have that fucking guy. I don't watch you out there with all these <laughs> fucking crazy people, whatever, but right. that makes me want to mention these two statements, both from O'Neill that he mentioned in this Asbury Park Press article. And I think they were really interesting and it really helped to show how dedicated he was to his profession outside of like literally coming out of retirement for it. But he stated, quote, to me is like a disease or a drug addiction. I just can't stop. End quote. And that's obviously in in regards to being in this PI work. And the second states, quote, we do a lot of fact finding on missing persons cases. We're also like social workers getting involved with people's problems. This work just gets a grip on you. End quote. So I feel like in a way I could kind of relate to him. Be like, I am so knee deep in all of this. Like if I could spend my entire profession, like just focusing on these cases and like, Mm -hmm. obviously doing the be- the best and the most that we can with a podcast. But right. like if I had his resources at my fingertips, you know, like what could I find? Yeah, and yeah. All this interesting stuff. But anyway, the PIs stated that these particular cases were more difficult to work because they weren't getting a lot from the original detectives on the case. And come to find out, Jan's case had actually been closed by authorities. And according to this article, it was closed, quote, years ago. It's just crazy to me. We don't know what year, though. No, we don't know what year they closed it. The thing that's crazy to me, though, is like, how can you deem this girl a runaway? Supposedly, that's what I'm assuming that they did, especially because they closed the case. You would think that they were like, yep, she ran away. That's it. But would you think that they would have, I don't know, maybe checked her social security number, her bank accounts, anything like that? Maybe, you know, check into if any of her information had ever been used again before closing this case? Did they confirm she was alive and well and just didn't want to be found? Did they roll out foul play? I mean, what kind of info did they have that led them to closing the case? I don't know the answer to that, unfortunately. Yeah, I can't think of anything in particular that would allow you to close a case, especially of a missing person. Mm -hmm. But if she was never entered as a missing person and it was just like documented as... Took a report, she ran off. Right, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's not even a report that would stay open. No. Like if you're just going somewhere and talking to somebody and documenting that you talk to them and this is what they said. That's just it. It's a statement, right? Right. And you're not going through and you're not entering them as a missing person and you're not mm-hmm. alerting other agencies. There's no case to be left open. Yeah. It's just bizarre. It is very strange. But now at this point in 1997 is when the timeline of events and kind of what happened the night Jan went missing was revealed. Because remember, nothing was reported early on, like at all. The fleeting mentions of Jan being missing didn't give any specifics about her case. However, I gave you a few tidbits from the night she disappeared already, but far more was revealed in 1997 regarding the circumstances surrounding her disappearance. And I told you to remember that there was a lot more that went into her potentially being labeled as a runaway, and we're about to get into that. So first of all, It's reported that before Jan vanished on June 26, 1973, she left a note that was said to be addressed to God. It's unclear what the note said, but one of the PIs stated, quote, She apparently knew she was leaving. She felt like she needed to get a new life somewhere, but something happened for her to not get in touch with her family again, end quote. Also, in this letter, she had apparently mentioned her baby's father, 
but never revealed his name or anything to identify who he was. At least I don't believe so. I definitely know that his name was not listed there. Yeah, I mean, you got to think if you put yourself in her shoes, Mm -hmm. she could have felt very vulnerable. She could have been targeted and groomed by somebody who did not have her best interest at heart. Yeah. And maybe the person that picked her up that night had ill intentions. Very possible. It was also stated that the letter was not only addressed to God, but was essentially a will. In this letter, she supposedly said she wanted to give away some of her horses, more specifically, three of her favorite horses, and she wanted to give them to a friend. I don't believe she actually physically ended up giving the horses to said friend. I think this will of sorts was her saying she wished to give them to said friend. I know, this is a lot so far, and we haven't even gotten to the doozy yet. So what I'm about to tell you is reported to have been in the original police file on this case, but again, was never reported publicly until now in 1997. Maybe because it's now a closed case, though. Maybe. Definitely possible. But once the PIs got involved, talked to the officers on the case back then, probably talked to current officers, took a hold of the case file, or at the very least were given info from the case file, they uncovered that back in August of 1973... Two months after Jan went missing, a baby was found in a mailbox. Was it alive? Yes. What the fuck? (laughs) Yes. Come to find out, that mailbox was located at a farm in Jefferson Township, New Jersey. And guess what was, or actually guess who was located at that farm in Jefferson Township? The friend that Jan wanted to gift her horses to. Hmm. Now, the baby found was a girl, and she was supposedly born right around the exact same time frame of when Jan was due to give birth to her baby. You got me thinking now. I don't know if she was having a boy or a girl, but if she went missing at the end of June and was said to be six or seven months pregnant, the math, at the very least, matches up. I also looked up to see when gender confirmation was used in ultrasounds, And I can't quite tell if it was used back in the early 70s, so I don't know if Jan would have known what she was having at that point. So I am curious if she knew if she was having a boy or a girl or if it was a surprise. But honestly, if anybody out there knows the answer to that, like when they started using ultrasound technology to like actually determine the sex of a baby, I'd be very interested to know. But anyway, as soon as I learned this information about the case, I was instantly searching for articles regarding a baby found in a mailbox because, um... That's kind of a big deal. I feel like that's pretty freaking newsworthy. Yeah, I used to think that they were dropped off on the the stoop by the stork, not by the (laughs) mailman. (laughs) Yeah, seriously. But I was only able to find one article from when this initially happened so that I could, like, try and corroborate this information. And it's not that I don't believe what was in the police file or what the PIs were saying. I absolutely do. But, of course, like, I want to look for it and find it with my own eyes. So the article I found was in the Herald News, and it's from August 27th, 1973. It's a very short piece, so I'm going to read pretty much most of it for you right now. Quote, an infant girl who was found abandoned in a large rural mailbox here last week was reported today in good condition in Dover General Hospital. Police are seeking the mother. The infant, 12 to 24 hours old at the time, was wrapped in a blanket and left in the mail at the Wigan Farms, end quote. I also looked up the farm, and I'm pretty sure I'm saying it correctly. I think it's Wigan Farm. And I also believe this farm is like a part of an organization known as the Department for Persons with Disabilities, a.k.a. DPD. Maybe that's why Jan had a friend from there, because she had her clubbed foot, she had her injured hand. Mm, may- yeah, I didn't even think of that. That's a good point. Mm-hmm. So maybe that was like... Maybe she was like a friend that really comforted her. Mm-hmm. And that's why she wanted to give her horses to this person. Yeah. Leave the baby because maybe they were a good person. They were, they were thoughtful. They cared for her. So she thought that the best place to leave the baby would have been with them. Yeah, that's a good point. Also, I've tried as best I can to see if the farm that this baby was left at, Wigan Farms, was the same farm as the one Jan's friend lived on or worked at that she wanted to give these horses to. Unfortunately, I was never able to find out what this friend's name was or the name of the farm that she lived or worked at. And I haven't really been able to nail anything down. But honestly, what are the odds of something like this happening in this area in New Jersey in the exact month that Jan was due to give birth? I have to think that they're somehow connected. 
I mean, I would bet my paycheck on it. Truly. There's like no other way that there was another farm in Jefferson Township in August of 1973 where a baby was found in a mailbox. Like there are literally, it's like one to a million, if not more. Well, yeah. I mean, on top of that, you also have the fact that the baby was left with the friend that she had put in her will to give the horses to. Well, it wasn't necessarily with said friend, but it was at the farm where the friend lived or worked. So, okay. yeah. Yeah. So. But still, yeah, it's just wild. It's, it's absolutely be her wild. Baby. So, I was also searching to see if I could find any additional articles or comments about this baby found in the mailbox over the years, but I couldn't find anything in newspaper archives back in the 70s, 80s, or 90s. But decades later, in 2011, there was an update article done on this baby that was found at Wigan Farms. Obviously, I haven't confirmed 100% that, you know, this is definitely connected, but like we were just saying, I'm pretty sure it's one in the same. But either way, in this update article, it talks about what went down the day the baby was found, and it's a little bit more detailed than that other article I found. So the article on Patch.com, written by Sue Toth, states, quote, In the summer of 1973, Walter was living in Oak Ridge at Wigan Farms. He went out to the mailbox every day, which was an essential part of his daily routine. It was his job and his job alone. Walter felt very important, and he was there like clockwork, even if the mail was not. He took great pride in completing this task. On August 17, 1973, Walter went to the mailbox and came back with a very special package in hand. Walter came into the house with a newborn infant, only hours old, wrapped in an old army blanket, end quote. The article continues, quote, It was like a miracle, a beautiful newborn infant. Someone abandoned her in the DPD's mailbox, presumably because they knew they were Catholic charities and the baby would be cared for. It was something that Walter never forgot. Without Walter, the baby would have surely perished in the summer heat, end quote. Could Walter have been the baby's dad? No, absolutely not. Walter was an individual that I believe also had a disability that lived at this farm within this Catholic charity and all of that. Gotcha. So he was like the one that found her, though, and he was just so like enamored with her. And I remember reading in the article, he was so upset when they took the baby away. And it was just like this thing that stuck with him. I mean, imagine that, though, like yeah. finding a, a baby, like literally they said 12 to 24 hours old. This is a brand new newborn. In an old army blanket. Mm, I thought that was interesting, too, because it didn't say that in the beginning mm -hmm. or in the earlier article. It just said that she was wrapped in a blanket. That could be something important to help try and narrow down the person that picked her up. Mm -hmm. Because if she had the baby with this person that picked her up from the farm, yep. they happen to have an old army blanket with them. Mm -hmm. Were they a member of the army or a veteran? Yeah, that's absolutely something to look into. Obviously, I'm sure that if anyone could have confirmed back in 73 if the baby was Jan's, they would have. But, of course, we know DNA testing didn't become prevalent until the mid to late 80s. Later on, though, I believe around this late 90s time frame, DNA testing was completed on the baby that was found in the mailbox. Obviously, she was now an adult, and it's said that the testing was done against Jan's mother's DNA by a company known as Cellmark, and it was confirmed that the baby did not belong to Jan Cotta. The DNA was not a match. I don't know. What's the percentage chance that the DNA used from her mother would prove a match to the child? Is it like 50% chance? 75% chance? I don't know. 99.9999% chance? I have absolutely no idea. I don't know how that works. I just don't believe that this is not her baby. So I'm really glad that you said that because you are like the Redditors and the web sleuths of the world. And I think that I say that in like every episode because anything that the people on these forums say, like you always <laughs> have like the same thing to say. And I'll agree. I think it's... Uh, you mean I don't have an original thought in my mind? No, that's not what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but... I think it's absolutely wild that the DNA didn't match. And when I saw that, I was I was pretty stunned. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. This coincidence feels like more than that, more than just a coincidence. How is it? Like I said it before, what are the odds that all of this happened exactly as it happened and now this baby isn't hers? There are some people on Reddit and Web Sleuths that wonder if the testing might have been flawed due to it not being directly tested against Jan's DNA. And then there are others that have commented about these weird phenomenons where I guess there are certain people who don't have like 
I guess for lack of a better way of saying it, similar DNA markers to their kids. But also, wouldn't you think that the testing would be pretty accurate? I don't know. That's why I asked. I don't know either. And this is what I'm saying. Like, this case has just boggled my freaking mind. I mean, I think a child to a parent, Mm -hmm. I think, is a fair way to judge DNA. But when you're adding now a grandchild to a grandparent, Mm -hmm. there's an extra layer from somebody that does not have a DNA line similar to the grandparent getting mixed into that serum or yeah, mixture. But wouldn't you think that well, I'm like the lineage like, would match? Like you would have to say, like if we had a child, that if you tested our child against your mother's DNA, that there would be some indication that they were related. Right, but I'm sure there are instances where it doesn't show that. I know there are people that track their lineage back hundreds and thousands of years, but... Mm. I mean, crazy shit happens. I think that based on what we know, there's no fucking way that this is not her baby. (laughs) If it is, it's like, what, random people are just popping out fucking babies and dropping them off in the mailbox? Well, something else that had come up I know that you said that it was because of the Catholic charity and the baby would be cared for and stuff, so maybe Mm -hmm. that's why the mother had dropped off the baby there because Mm -hmm. of that reason. But the timeline of how pregnant she was versus when the baby was found and... Mm -hmm. All that? Yeah, like, people had said things thinking that maybe somebody else had been pregnant and had, like, taken advantage of this opportunity because they knew Jan was missing and all this. I'm like, if it wasn't even publicized, like, how? What? You think this person's playing, like, 5D chess saying, (laughs) oh, this missing woman was pregnant. 5D chess. (laughs) Some people say 4D. I was was taking it up a notch. Oh, okay, okay. Like, four dimension, five dimension. I see what you're saying, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) But I don't know. There's no friggin' way that some other random person that was just as pregnant as Jan yeah. was like, oh, this girl's missing and she has a connection to this farm, farm and, place, yeah. so I'm going to plop out my baby and throw it in the mailbox. Yeah, isn't that just so bizarre? Like, no. I don't know. So now if that anything, you- they knew nothing about Jan and they just knew that it was a Catholic charity yeah. and they couldn't take care of the baby. And it's just the oddest of circumstances and coincidences. Right. That's the only other thing I can think of. Yeah. So now that you know all of this and you know about the note that she left and you know about the the situation with the baby in the mailbox, if you're thinking it might actually be Jan's baby, are you now of the mindset and like kind of understanding why, like maybe this is why this case wasn't talked about for so long because it was considered like she left because she wanted to leave. She said it. Yeah. I mean, at this point, you can't really be that mad at the cops. No, no. And that's why I said it's like not like it was with Mitchell and Bonnie's case where the family was pushing and they're like, no, there's absolutely no way. We need you to investigate this, that, and the other thing, you know. Now, with this case, it's like, I'm sure her family thought too in the beginning, like, oh my God, she left. This is horrible. We miss her. Her parents put out that plea. They're saying, come back or and we want to know thinking, you're alive. Right, and I was thinking the same thing where the police very well could have helped convince the family That no, you know, she left. Yeah, she told you she left. And then Brian, Mm -hmm. all this time later, is like, you know, this just never sat right with me. Mm -hmm. I don't think that she ran away. I don't think that she would have just disappeared and never called or never talked Mm -hmm. to us again. And then he took it on his behalf to go out to these private investigators and say, hey, can you look into this? Yeah. To clear his own conscience. I can totally see that, especially because he was the last person to see her. Right. And then you have to consider, too... Maybe she did. Maybe she ran away and maybe they all believed this and they were like, okay, she was unhappy. Maybe she was under a lot of pressure, a lot of stress. She was going to become a new mom. She was going through a lot. Obviously, she had these medical conditions that she was dealing with. That was probably really hard for her. And then once they realized, like, and again, we don't know what's in the note. If we knew what was in the note and had a little bit more specifics, maybe that's why they think she decided to leave. But now... After all this time, like, we know she would have come back and we know she would have talked to us. There's no way that she would just be completely MIA for decades. Probably left, maybe wanted to start over, and then she would have called us. I don't know. Who knows if she was dead set on leaving and left this note and dropped off her baby in the mailbox. Mm -hmm. Maybe something happened in her life that seemed inconsequential to everybody else around her Mm -hmm. that just set her on a path to be like, I want to get out of here. Yeah, and it might just be something that nobody knows. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely changed my mind after finding out that she left this note. Mm Mm-hmm. The note was big, and And I think... I assume the note was in her handwriting. 
I believe so. But that, again, this case hasn't been like very overly reported. There hasn't yeah. been a ton done on it. So I'm not sure. I, that's a good question. I'd like to know. Mm -hmm. Like imagine if it was a typed letter. Right. You know, a, like a typed letter or in handwriting that's not hers. And it was a forged letter. Yeah. Left to make people think that she ran away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, something fucked up happened where yeah. this person left the letter after they took her and mm -hmm. forced her in the car and mm -hmm. i mean i've heard of cases where that's happened where people are like that's not my mom or my dad or my whoever's yeah. handwriting mm -hmm. and i mean i would think if they believed that they would have said something about it in the beginning to say like there's no way she you wrote this so. or something like that yeah now outside of that that's all that really came out in jan's case for a little while outside of it being reported that the pi's involvement seemed to have prompted the wall pd to become interested in or even consider reopening the case again even though it had been closed for a while, it seems like everyone believed Jan ran off, especially now considering the note, considering everything else we know so far. But it was stated that authorities did do some follow-ups in the 80s and 90s, but it's completely unclear how much was done or how thick their file became, but I can only imagine there probably wasn't much in there. But before we move forward into the next bit of info on this case, I did want to mention something that I read in one of these articles about the PIs that made me feel not so crazy for my obsession with finding people's properties and scrutinizing their tax and mortgage records. So the article mentioned that Ed O'Neill had believed getting a real estate license was helpful in his profession as a private investigator. The article continues, quote, This way, you learn about deeds and mortgages. These are the types of records we use. You learn where to go for information. It's surprising how much information you can get on a missing person case from these records, end quote. So... I guess my obsession with looking into that aspect of people's lives is actually a good thing, and a PI has said it's important, so I feel validated now. Now you need to get your real estate license. Now I do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> One step closer to being a PI, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> now, as time continues on, things weren't completely stagnant in Jan's case. It's reported in an article with the Asbury Park Press that Jan's case was reopened by the Wall PD in December of 2004, now, this time, after two of Jan's siblings came forward, Brian, who had previously pushed with his wife to get the PIs involved initially, as well as her sister, Robin, and they'd reached out to Wall PD to see what they could do about reinvestigating or reopening Jan's missing persons case. And from there, things seemed to kind of explode in this case in terms of individuals and agencies working on it and the leads that were looked into. It's reported that Detective Lieutenant Gerald Inkin, as well as Detective Joseph Wilbert, were working on the case, along with at least four other officers within the Wall Police Department. So they reopened the case? They did, yes, officially. All right. Not only were multiple officers from the Wall PD involved, so were a handful of other agencies. The state police, the Monmouth County Prosecutor's Office, the FBI, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and even the freaking U.S. Secret Service. Secret Service? Yes, yeah, so I was like, you're joking. The Secret Service. Mr. President, we have a missing girl on our hands. <laughs> right? That's crazy. It is crazy. One of the biggest things discussed, or I guess not really discussed at all, but it's something that I think everyone wanted to know about, is the fact that police just would not say anything about who Jan's baby's father was. And I honestly don't even know if they know, but they declined to even answer or discuss anything about it with reporters. So it made me like a little sus. You mean with all these agencies that came in, they couldn't bring in Maury Povich? I know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if you were going to get the reference. I got it. Yes. <laughs> I'm not that young. But there was actually like a ton of stuff that had been done over the past couple of years on this case when this update was put out. So the update article was from 2007 and the case had been reopened at the very end of 2004. So you had about two full years of work being poured into this case from all of these different agencies. The investigation into Jan's disappearance had now spanned over five states, including New Jersey, Ohio, Florida, New York, and Pennsylvania. And it's reported that over 250 interviews had been completed during this two-year time frame as well. How the hell did they get down to Florida? Because everybody goes missing in Florida? I think it's probably like if people were involved in the case or knew Jan or something like that, maybe they moved. Uh, because, you know, the older they get, the... The more, likely more southern they, are to they get, go. <laughs> to get down to Florida. Probably. I'll, I'll go. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I'll take the warm weather over freaking New England. Yeah. But clearly things were being taken seriously at this point, and it seemed as though authorities had a vested interest in trying to learn more about Jan, learn about her case, and hopefully find her. One investigator told the Asbury Park Press, quote, 
I didn't know Jan Cotta. I never met her before, and I wanted to learn as much as I could about her in order to do a thorough investigation. At this stage of the investigation, if there's anybody we missed, we would ask on the family's behalf and on the behalf of Wall Police Department, please come forward at this time. Whether you want to identify yourself or remain anonymous, we want to be able to tell the family what happened to Jan, end quote. Authorities were also said to be attempting to use what was described as advanced technology in her case. <laughs> what? <laughs> we're using advanced technology. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, it's just such a bland term. It is, yeah. But there's another interesting statement in this piece that goes along with the advanced technology comment, and that was about DNA. And it stated that authorities would be using a, quote, DNA comparison of Kata's genetic makeup to those of unidentified remains, end quote. I'm very curious as to what this means, because they don't have Jan's DNA. Obviously, if they did, they probably would have tested it against the baby, now adult woman. But how can they compare it then? Like, what are they comparing? Her genetic makeup? I mean... I don't know enough about genetics and DNA and your body's DNA makeup to really understand yeah. how they would have hers to compare to anything else. Like, they don't have dental records. Because she had no dental work done. Exactly. So that's huge, too. Right. I don't know. I wonder if it's like this advanced technology can take like certain markers from like, and I keep using the word markers like I know what they mean, <laughs> but it's like these DNA markers that maybe would like be the most common, like within a family or something. All I can think of is like, say you can create a picture of the DNA markers mm -hmm. and it's like some type of image. Mm -hmm. If you could print hers mm -hmm. on a transparent piece of paper mm -hmm. or like, a, you know, the the overhead projector oh, slides. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Yeah. And then you take whatever you're comparing it to, mm -hmm. put it over each other and mm -hmm. see if things like overlap. Yeah. That's all I can really think of. Yeah, I don't know. It's but That's probably very juvenile compared to like the actual right. science that goes into it. But it's like the dumbed down version of like how our brains can like <laughs> comprehend right. this. Well, that's what I was thinking too with like those vintage maps that you were talking about yeah yep yep. that's what i was thinking like if you were to take them and you can find a one landmark a that you can put thing, on, t yeah. on top of each other yep and then overlap them can you kind of figure out where you are or yeah well that goes back to like what i said earlier about how i could kind of relate to what ed o'neill was saying where it's like yeah i could get knee deep in these cases and i could look through all of these archives i bet i could go to like libraries in new jersey and find maps of the right, area right. and like do all this but I don't have the funds or the time to be able to be <laughs> flying to other places and right. doing all this stuff. But if I did, like, I could get lost in this and I could just spend all my time, like, trying to find these people. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the most interesting tidbit to come out of this article, the update one in 2007, at least to me, it's the most interesting. But it had to do with something both Brian and Robin had to say about Jan's friends at the time. Her brother stated that he, quote, does not understand why people who were friends of his sister at the time of her disappearance do not want to talk to the authorities about information they may have, end quote. Robin, Jan's sister, seemed to affirm those feelings and stated, quote, you have people who you know, and they know something, and you can't get their help, and you know they're living here, living in the Monmouth County area, and you know they know, end quote. Now, these comments appear to be in regards to Jan's close friends back in 73 when she disappeared. And obviously, from what I've gathered, and I'm sure what you gathered from those two quotes, the family believes that these friends know more that they're either not willing to discuss or not willing to discuss with law enforcement or what. But yeah, you've got to think so. I mean, if Jan didn't confide in her family what her plan was. Mm hmm. You would think that she had talked to someone mm -hmm. and her closest friends would be those next people in line. We talked about this in Judy Smith. Yeah. How you would more than likely not vent to your kids about your marital problems or all these other things. You would most likely have these conversation with your close friends. So I am sure even if she was just going through something, maybe she was depressed. Maybe she was dealing with something like that. Somebody had to her know the baby's daddy had to too. Know. Yeah. There's no way no one knows who the baby's daddy is. Yeah. Unless I did see it mentioned here or there that people believe and there's absolutely nothing to substantiate this but I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility what if it was a sexual assault yep. or like maybe she was at a party you know something went down that shouldn't have and now I'd be interested to know what was said in that letter around the father the father absolutely if it was in a positive or a negative light I completely which agree. would help kind of 
make you lean one way or the other on was it a consensual thing or not. Yeah, definitely. Now, as far as like how the family feels with like, oh, I have all these people that live around here Mm -hmm. that know shit and Mm -hmm. nobody's talking just made me think of Jerry from Teresa Corley's case. It's funny you say that because I was just thinking about Mickey Broham. Yeah, that's and how it's all these small towns where everyone knows everyone. And Mm -hmm. it's like, you know, they know information and they won't fucking say anything. Yeah. We were just talking about this earlier before we recorded. But Wall is a census designated place, which I had no idea what that was. Yeah. But essentially, it's a freaking small town. (laughs) Like, that's what it seems like. Yeah. So you've got these small towns where everyone knows everyone. And then everyone probably knows everything. And then no one will fucking talk. Yeah. And you wonder why. Yeah, I mean, come on, think about this now. We're 49 years later. Mm -hmm. All of these people are at least in their late 60s, early 70s. Right. Like, come on. Mm -hmm. You're older now. What kind of allegiance do you have? And they probably have information that's really, like, they withheld it for no reason. Yes, I bet. I bet. It's probably so trivial. They thought it was, like, this big thing back in the day, Mm -hmm. and it could be huge to this case, but, like, not affect them or their life in any way by revealing it. Right. Now, after this, about seven more years went by before anything new was released in Jan's case. But now is when I want everyone listening to take a second, stop what you're doing, and pay close attention to this next part. So, first of all, an article in the Asbury Park Press announced that the Wall Township PBA Local 234 and Crime Stoppers were now offering a $10,000 reward for information in Jan's case. And I believe at this point, John, correct me if I'm wrong, but... It's believed by investigators that Jan may be deceased and not off living her life somewhere else based on this particular comment. It states the reward is for, quote, information leading to the recovery of Kata, her remains, or the arrest of the person responsible for her disappearance, end quote. I think recovery can be somewhat ambiguous. Okay, that was like the word that hung me up a little bit. But the way that it makes my mind go is they're trying to find her remains yeah not necessarily totally foul play but they do not think she's alive is what i've gathered i don't know i'm thinking foul play i'm i mean i am too but i think that that comment read that comment again information leading to the recovery of kata her remains or the arrest of the person responsible for her disappearance yeah so i'm thinking i mean she's an adult she could be responsible for her own disappearance Yes. But when they're adding in the recovery of her, yeah, her remains, or the person responsible for her disappearance, yeah, that makes me think foul play. That makes me think that they're leaning towards her being deceased, most likely murdered. Yeah, that's what I thought too. But that's not what I wanted you all to listen very closely about. It's this next tidbit. And that's that investigators were trying to track down a man by the name of Eric Shore. Well, potentially that name. It seems as though the spelling of his last name is not known. Any articles that I've seen mention this Eric guy spell his last name S-H-O-R-E. But it could be some variation or even a name similar like Shaw. S-H-A-W. Yeah. But regardless of the spelling... Or short. Yeah, I mean, it could essentially be any variation that is similar to Shore that someone could Mm -hmm. mistake for that type of last name. Yep. But regardless of the spelling or exactly what the last name is, it's stated that this Eric guy was 40 years old back in 1973. So he would be nearly 90 today. But back in 2014, when this was put out to the public, he would have been around 80. It's also mentioned that he was either from Long Island or Staten Island. And there's also another identifying piece of information authorities gave to hopefully try and track him down. And that's that back in 73, I guess he'd had a girlfriend, and this girlfriend was supposedly working in a town called Deal, D-E-A-L, in New Jersey, and she worked as a hairdresser there. Also, one of the detectives stated, quote, We are attempting to locate him. He is not a suspect, said Wilbert, adding that Shore may have information about Jan Cotta from around the time of her disappearance, end quote. First thing. I wonder if Shore or Shaw or Short, Mm -hmm. this Eric guy, was a veteran. Very good question, especially considering his age. Considering his age and considering the army blanket that the baby was found in. Mm -hmm. So if that baby is connected to Jan, like we think it might be, there could be a connection there. 
Okay, so when I first heard about this Eric guy, the first thing that came to my mind was, was he the guy driving the car that came to the property the night that Jan disappeared? I'm thinking that whoever picked her up is also linked to dropping the baby up. I don't know. I just can't get away from this baby not being hers. So I could I know, be totally I know. fucking way off Yeah, thinking that like, oh, this person that picked her up is the same person that was with her when she dropped the baby off and mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. But I'm thinking whoever picked her up was going to ferry her away from this life and uh-huh. whatever. And during that time period, she had the baby. This person just so happened to have the army blanket in the car. Mm-hmm. Dropped the baby off at this farm. the mailbox at the farm. Yep. So... The only thing that I found a little bit like contradictory to this, I guess, is the fact that police supposedly talked to the owner of the vehicle. However. How did they know the vehicle? Because I thought they didn't get a good description of the vehicle. No, the description has never been released. Oh. So I don't know if Robin had a description. She obviously knew something about whoever this person was. It was said that they were an acquaintance of hers. Gotcha. Acquaintance is also a good term to use for someone that's 40 years old. <laughs> so 21 <laughs> right. years older than Jan. Mm-hmm. So then I was thinking something that, I don't know, maybe not everybody thinks of this, but this was something that popped into my head. But okay, they talked to the owner of this vehicle. Was that the operator of the vehicle? Exactly. Mm. That did Mm. not mean that the owner was also the driver. It could have been a totally different person. How many times do people drive cars that they're not the owner of? Right. I do it every day. (laughs) (laughs) So who was the owner of the vehicle? Don't know. Did that owner have a younger son? I don't know. Those are good questions to ask. But then I thought back, I'm like, okay, well, then they were saying this whole and I don't know how much I believe of that previous article we talked about anyway, but like, oh, she's last seen leaving with this 22-year-old guy. Is that the guy that was driving the car? Like, I don't know. I don't know. So it's like that article kind of did itself in, though, with like <laughs> all the discrepancies, all the things like, that were wrong. It's right. like, well, are you actually accurate with right. what you're saying here? Well, I don't it know. It doesn't seem that way. Yeah. Seems like whoever wrote this might have been a little drunk. <laughs> right? So then something I think that we've already kind of touched on is outside of the potential of this Eric guy being the operator of the vehicle that came to the property the night that Jan disappeared, could he have been Jan's baby's father? Right. And then could that be why we know that this guy had a girlfriend back then? He's 21 years older than her. Could it be why she wouldn't tell who the baby's father was? Did he have any ties to the horsing community, this Eric guy? Don't know. We don't know anything about Eric. The only Mm. thing we know is that police want to talk to him. I mean, you got to think that the father of the baby had to be either horse show related or horse show adjacent. Yeah. Maybe something like that. It seemed like that was her life. So So if she's going to come in contact with anybody, it's either somebody that's coming for a lesson Mm -hmm. at the farm and she's helping them with it or somebody that she's seeing while she's out doing her, Mm -hmm. you know, everyday stuff or her competitions. and Could also be an instructor. Because she did go to these, like, academies and all these equine clinics. Right, which is why I'm saying, you know, horse show or horse show adjacent or whatever. Yeah, something to do with the 4-H club. Yeah. So here's something that we haven't touched on yet. And it's also one of the questions that I'm left with. But when Jan was last seen in the barn tack room or barn tack house, whatever it was called, She was seen with her little round, well, I say little, I would assume it's little just based on the description of it, but her round tweed purse. She's not seen with a suitcase. She's not seen with a backpack. She's not seen with something like a duffel bag or something that would hold clothes or things that she would bring with her. Was she not really running away that night? And then something happened. You got to think that this is a house with 10 people living in it. Correct. You think if she grabbed a suitcase and took it outside... Or grabbed a suitcase and packed her belongings. Yeah. That nobody would have seen anything. Okay, I get what you're saying there. But then I guess I want to know, was any of her stuff taken? Did she take money at the very least? If she was like, I'm going to leave my whole life behind all my clothes, everything I have. I'm going to give my horses to my friends. Is she going to take a couple bucks with her? Like, you always hear about that. Like, you hear about Tracy Crow's case. Like, where they're like, oh, she left a bunch of money in her room and all this stuff. Right, but if she didn't have access to a lot of money or... If her plan would have been foiled because of somebody seeing her packing stuff into a suitcase, if she's leaving with some 40-year-old guy that's potentially the father of her child, Mm -hmm. he's probably like, yeah, I got everything all set. You don't have to worry about anything. You don't have to bring anything. And then... Maybe that was the plan all along. Maybe. Maybe it was, you're going to have the baby, we're going to give the baby up, and then they 
decided that he was going to hurt her or maybe something. Who knows? I don't know. I was going to say when you were talking about the money, she also gave riding lessons. You have to assume that she was making a little bit of money from that. So she probably had something. Well, I mean, she could have had that in her wallet. If she. Ah, true. If you have seven siblings, are you going to leave money hanging around or are you going to keep it in your purse and your wallet around with you? Yeah, probably keep it around so your siblings don't steal it from <laughs> right. you. Yeah. So all of her money could have been in that purse. That's true. Yeah. I just find it interesting, though, that she wouldn't have anything else with her and she's literally got the clothes on her back, a little purse, and that's it. Well, whoever convinced her to leave, if they did, mm -hmm. could have very well said, I'll have everything squared away. Yeah. You don't need to bring anything. Yeah. And that's what makes me think then, like, could this have been someone older than her? And that's why she didn't reveal who he was. Could he have been in a relationship right. or married or it was this, you know, nefarious thing that shouldn't have taken place in the first place. But maybe he's like, I want to take you away from this life and I want to, you know, raise this baby together and blah, blah, blah. And then things just turned out completely not as they should. Yeah. Or something that kind of goes along with what you were just saying is say this was an older person, mm -hmm. say they had a family or a relationship or whatever. They knew that she was seven months pregnant. Maybe they were trying to fix their situation. Mm -hmm. In I say that with air quotes, mm -hmm. set her up somewhere. Yep. Comfortable. Waited till she had the baby. They weren't going to kill their unborn baby. They weren't going to kill their newborn baby. Mm -hmm. But they also could have bring it back to their family mm -hmm. or their relationship. That's kind of yeah. That's kind of what I was getting at before. Yeah. Yeah. So that's definitely at it's... the forefront of a possibility mm -hmm. as to what may have happened to her. Yeah, especially if police are now along the lines of foul play. Yes, I think. I know we always say that when we're speculating, we want to do that with facts. And mm -hmm. the knowledge that we have. Yep. If there's let me, a let very me limited these, amount of information. Well, there, there's enough information to come to this, I think. I don't think okay, that I'm pulling right. this out of my ass, right? Okay, so, hold on. Before you give us your theory, this is your theory? This is how I come to that last idea. Okay, so I just want to let you know at this point, this is everything that I've got on this case. I have not been able to find anything else. And like we were just saying, based on everything you know, we've kind of interpreted so far. It seems as though authorities and most people that have followed this case believe that Jan left of her own volition initially, but then something may have happened to her afterwards and she's now deceased. So kind of does go right. along with what you were saying. So I would love to hear how you came to that. So the reason I come to that as a potential... Theory of what happened, I think. Yeah, I guess. You have... Jan, five to seven months pregnant. I think probably seven months pregnant. Probably, yeah. Right? Especially if this baby was found in the mailbox in August, two yes. months later, nine months pregnant. It makes sense. Right. So you have her seven months pregnant. There's never talk of a boyfriend or a significant other. Mm -hmm. So no person like that ever investigated. She leaves this note, never identifying the father by name. We have this Eric person as a person of interest who's 40-something years old. Well, they didn't say he's a person of interest. They just said that they just want to talk to him. But They're I know that in him. <laughs> that's cop talk, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, a person of interest may be a witness. Yeah, and you can't determine if they're an actual witness or a person of interest until you talk to them. Right. Yeah, okay. Well, All right. They're, they're a person that, that law enforcement wants to speak to, right? Yeah. You have, assuming that the baby in the mailbox was Jan's, you have the baby being born, mm -hmm. being left with people that whoever dropped it off knows it'll be taken care of. Yep. Jan is never seen or heard from again. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a, a huge stretch to think that somebody that was married or in a relationship and had a family had a chance encounter with Jan. She ended up getting pregnant. They had to formulate some type of way to fix the situation, make Jan happy so she didn't go and spill the beans about what happened, mm -hmm. make sure, you know, that they're not killing their unborn baby. Mm-hmm. And get it somewhere where it can be taken care of, but never letting their family know about it. Yeah. It really seems like they put Jan somewhere where she would be comfortable, mm -hmm. waited until the baby was born, got the baby somewhere safe, maybe murdered Jan, mm -hmm. and then went on living their life like nothing ever happened. And how sad and unfortunate is that, that like this person probably manipulated her into like writing this note and, you know leading people to believe that she made this decision for her to just be like snuffed out like that. 
-hmm. and to know like this person had to know that with her leaving this note and whatever it is that she said in it in the right way they like there's no way that they thought that police would even look into this after that i don't think that they knew that she left the letter no you don't think i don't think so Hmm. i think that jan's infatuation with this person Mm -hmm. is the reason why they weren't named in the letter because she was sure that you know they were there for her they were gonna well they were there for her and this person expressed how important it was to not let anybody know about what happened that's very groomer because it would ruin everything yeah you know oh it'll ruin everything if anybody finds out but i really want to be with you oh my god you're taking this straight from riverdale (laughs) <laughs> I don't know about that yet, but... <laughs> yes, you do, Miss Grundy. Oh, yeah, kind of. You're well, taking I mean, it straight... Sorry for anyone that hasn't seen Riverdale. I've well, just have... spoiled it for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's only the first season and like six episodes in, so don't worry. <laughs> but... Yes, John's watching Riverdale. Everyone knows that now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also like from the teacher. Like, oh, yeah, no, yeah, it's yeah. like this... Um... Well, it's a very groomer mindset. That's what yeah. it is. Yeah, so I think that, unfortunately, that's where I've gotten to with the very limited amount of information that we have. Yeah. But, I mean, it makes sense. It does. I was telling John this earlier that this is the type of case where I would love to see a case file on this. I would love to see what the PIs uncovered. I would love to see what came of those 250 interviews. I want to know where they have been, who they've talked to, what this note said. There are so many things that I could just, like, dive so deep into with this case Because it's just so mysterious. Right. And I think that if we did have access to a case folder or something like that, it could totally nullify everything that I've just put forward. Absolutely. But that's the thing. When you don't have all the information, you have to take what you have. Right. With the little bit amount of information that we have, I don't think that I am going off the script of, you know, coming to that conclusion. I'm not pulling it out of my ass. Mm -hmm. I think that there is genuine evidence and facts and circumstances that have at least been released to the public that could lead somebody to the idea that this is probably or may be what happened. I completely agree. So now that we've kind of covered the theory, it seems, there was basically the three theories that I was able to find were... Don't tell me a fucking serial killer again. No, actually, no. One was a runaway. She left her life behind willingly, and then something happened to her, turned into foul play after the fact, which is pretty much the theory that you have put forth, John. The other is suicide. Some people have believed that maybe she wanted to leave her life behind, have her baby, give her baby up, and then kill herself. But I don't think so. I don't think so either. A lot of people, you know, would come up with ideas about how she was struggling with her medical conditions and a lot of other stuff. But she, I mean, come on, she had this issue with her foot and her wrist and her eye and all these things. And she was still crushing it in her horse shows and her competitions. I mean, Yeah, and if she doesn't show, and if she doesn't show a pattern of like depression, anxiety, suicidal attempts, or suicidal ideations ahead of time, I don't think that she would have died by suicide. If anything, if she has all these medical conditions, perhaps she had another underlying one that progressed faster, Mm -hmm. and maybe what I had put forward for her theory was totally wrong, and maybe she ran away and she was happily living with somebody else, but then. She had another medical condition that we didn't know about just yet at Mm. the age of 19. Yeah. And maybe something happened with that and she passed away, but not due to foul play. Yeah. I did see something. I can't remember if it was meningitis or measles. She had something when she was young that she she had issues from as well. So I don't, she clearly had a lot of underlying medical conditions. I mean, that could be something, but I don't think that's, there doesn't seem to be anything else here that's supporting that as a theory. And then, obviously, the only other one would be foul play in general. Like, had nothing to do with her potentially trying to leave her life behind. But I think the note and the baby found in the mailbox, even if it's supposedly not hers, which I don't know how much I believe that, but... I think whoever was involved in convincing her to run away Mm -hmm. to something better, whoever's tangled up in that is the person that would have been involved in foul play if it did occur. Yeah, I agree completely. So now we'll move on to the questions we're left with. I feel like I have a fair few of them this time. Um, I'm going to let you go because okay. I didn't really write a lot down. There's tons of information that I'd love to know. Yeah. But really, the questions, I'm kind of stumped. All right. Well, I'll give... I mean, I've had a lot more time to think about my questions, mm-hmm. whereas you have not because right. you've had it in this two-hour span of time. <laughs> <laughs> so my first one is, I would love to know more specifics about what was in the note. 
that Jan wrote. But more specifically, I'd want to know why it was a note to God and why it was not a note to her family. And was she particularly religious? Because then I think that could go back to something we talked about earlier with the tabooness of her being pregnant. If she was pregnant, she wasn't married. If that was even, you know, considered even worse, I guess, for a lack of a better way of saying it, because she was religious. I think that if I had to guess, she probably had some connection to religion. She must have. Why would you leave a letter to God? Well, you're leaving a letter to God, and then this baby who is not confirmed to be hers is then left in the mailbox of a Catholic charity. Yeah, definitely. There's definitely a connection there. There's got to be. Honestly, the coincidences like don't make sense. No. There's no way it's not connected. I just, I don't believe it. I want to know how the interview with the friend that was listed in that note went. I agree with that, definitely. They have to know something. I would think that's probably one of the close friends right. that Robin the, and Brian were talking about. Yeah. I'd also like to know, I would love to know her father's name. I could not find it anywhere. Yeah, any of the information about, you know, the parents. Just her parents' relationship in general, the horse farm, their their life. Like, I know we, we got little snippets of it, you know, with Robin and Brian expressing, like, how they all worked and did the chores on the farm and they took care of the horses and all of that. But I'd love to know more about the family dynamic in general and, you know, just more about Jan, too. I mean, I know we got a lot about her horses and, you know, that aspect of her life. But what was she outside of that? It's understandable that you want to know more about the people in this story. But I want to know more about her socially. Yes, exactly. I agree. Because I think that's where you're going to get the information that could help the investigation. Her life with family and stuff like that. It's great to know and to learn about her background and her as a person. Mm -hmm. But if you want to get to the bottom of what happened to her and talk to the people that probably know something, mm -hmm. you need to find the social circles that she was involved in. Did she not really talk to the people that she was at these horse shows, horse with. shows with? Yeah. Because, you know, maybe there were cliques and she didn't get along with them. So she talked to the people from the horse handlers. I don't know what they're called, but like, yeah. did she gravitate to a certain type of person, certain cliques, mm -hmm. find those people mm -hmm. and then start talking to people in those circles yeah. to hopefully get some information that, People probably have locked away that they thought was inconsequential. I say this very often mm -hmm. at the time, but now they realize that there are a lot of agencies looking into this case. Yeah. And they're searching and hoping for anything to come mm -hmm. forward. So Something that actually popped into my head just now, which I didn't even have written down here, but it's regarding that quote that I had read like very, very early on about Jan and how she was planning to go to England. Do you remember that? Where it I was do like, remember oh, that. later on in the year, she wanted to go to England to study for a year or something like that. How did that just get thrown to the wayside? That was four months before she went missing. Maybe she just found out she was pregnant. Maybe she's in I England. Mean, I mean, in the 70s, you didn't really need a lot to travel. No, but I just thought that was interesting. Like she had these plans. Right, she well, had these plans for her life. And now if you it was derailed. Of, well, you think it's derailed, but what if those plans came to fruition. What if she stayed in the area with this person that she left with until she had the baby? Mm. She left the baby somewhere where it would be cared for. Yeah. And they went to Europe and they've been living there. Who knows? But you have to assume that I she would have used it, a but... bank account. She would have used a social security number. This is yet another no, thing. Like I mean, in missing you... persons cases, you hear about this all the time. They if didn't use their the social, country, whatever. No. You'd know. No, no. If somebody left the country, they're probably starting a whole new life. Yeah, but that's hard to do, especially when you're young and you have no money. I know, but with, if you're with a 40-year-old person that has connections or if an older person. If that's the person. I don't know. I'm thinking that if somebody left in the 70s and they left the country, mm -hmm. they have a much greater chance of starting a new life and never being found. Rather than doing it within the U.S. Rather than doing it within the U.S. All right. I can, I can get behind that, I guess. But I don't think that's what happened here. I don't think so either, but... Then a lot of these other questions I had were things that we had gone over already, kind of why was she keeping the father's identity a secret, you know, discuss that, the whole pregnancy out of, you know, a marriage, could that have been frowned upon? Yep. And then I would like to know specifically if the detectives have spoken to and interviewed the person who not only owned the car, but also was the operator of that car that night, have they confirmed that it was one and the same mm -hmm. or is it two different people? Or yeah. did they never talk to that person and that's this Eric Shore guy that they want to talk to? Yeah, I'd like to know the same. I think that's a good question to have. Mm -hmm. 
was the vehicle, you know, owner operated at the time? Yeah. Or was it, I don't know, I think uh, that's something that you might not even have to dive into. They, they, you might just be able to get the answer. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, whoever owned it was the one that was driving it that night. Yeah. But then who owned it? And why were they just described as an acquaintance and not a friend yeah. or something more than that? That would lend itself more towards the theory I put forward earlier where yeah. this person was an acquaintance because they didn't want to seem, be seen together in public with Jan mm-hmm. because they had this other life with the family they were living, something like that. So yeah. it seemed as though they were only an acquaintance, but really they had this deeper connection because they shared an unborn child in common. And, yeah. But. Yeah, well, those are all the questions that I had. John, do you have any others? Nope, I think you covered them. All right. It's been just over 49 years since Jan Cotta went missing, and individuals that may know more about what happened to her aren't going to live forever. What's holding you back now? Fear of what? Allegiance to who? Like authorities said, you can stay anonymous. So if you're scared, anonymity is still possible. And from what I can tell, authorities and the family truly just want to know what happened to Jan all those years ago. Detective Wilbert told the Coast Star the following, quote, If someone knows details about Jan's disappearance, please come forward. You can remain anonymous. Our goal is to find Jan and to provide information about Jan's disappearance to the Cotta family. That's our intent. If anyone reading this article assisted Jan in her disappearance, if Jan voluntarily left, there's no legal repercussions. If you know anything about what happened to Jan Cotta or where she may be, please contact the Wall Township Police Department at 732-449-4500. Thank you all so much for tuning in every week. We're so happy to have you here. Make sure to leave us a five-star review before you go and follow us on our socials. You can follow us on Instagram at wicked.deeds.podcast and on Twitter at Wicked Deeds. Don't forget to visit our website, wickeddeedspodcast.com, to take a look at any photos from this episode and view our source material. But most importantly, tune in next week for an all-new episode.